I, I'm not going to take up a lot of your time because I know that you've, you've come to hear Mike talk, but I do want to say a couple of things by, by way of introduction. Uh, of, of course, I, I suspect for many he, he's best known as the captain of the England team from 1977 to 81. A, a few other statistics to go with that. He, uh, he received his Middlesex cap in 1964, was the Cricket Writers Club Young Cricketer of the Year in 1964, also which I hadn't known until I, until I was looking into this, won his Cambridgeshire cap in 1966, which I'm delighted to hear about as, as a native of Cambridgeshire, and was, was Middlesex captain from 71 to 82, that, that, that golden age of, of success for them, and, and Wisden Cricketer of the Year, in, in, well, one of the Wisden Cricketers of the Year of 1977. He also shares the distinction with Kevin Peterson, of being the only former England test captain to also have become president of the British Psychoanalytic Society. <laughs> Although I, I think I need to double check that out. That, that. <laughs> Mike made his test debut uh, in, in the first test against the West Indies in 1976, aged 34. And as I recall, spent most of the first two days of his test career watching Viv Richards bat, uh, which might be particularly appropriate for, given the topics uh, under discussion today, and maybe gave him a chance to reflect on what do they know of cricket who only cricket know. In any case, I, I think that this, this does leave Mike in a pretty well unique situation for a cricketer, an English cricketer of that era. In his test career against the West Indies, he remained undefeated. <laughs> I just want to say, to say one more thing which, which came out of uh, my research to, to introduce him, because it also seemed particularly apt. I, I was listening yesterday to, to Mike's appearance in September 1977 on Desert Island Discs. And... Uh, among his selections, there, there are two that I, I was particularly interested in. First of all, an extract from The Tempest, which seems to be a very fitting, and the most fitting of all, of course, of Shakespeare's plays uh, uh, for, for this conference, a, a, a play that is often written about uh, as being associated with the, the moment of white encounter with the Americas. Uh, the, 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 the short poem song, where, where the bee sucks, there suck I, in a cowslip's bell I lie. There I couch when owls do cry, on the bat's back I do fly. After summer, merrily, 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 shall I live now under the blossom that hangs on the bough. And it struck me, reading this and thinking about this, that I'd never noticed before that this was also a cricket poem. You know, Shakespeare was possibly confused. I, I, I don't know where cow slip is. It's that, that sort of hybrid of, uh, of cow corner and fly slip. But it might have been useful against Viv, maybe. I don't, I don't know. And also this idea of on the bat's back I do fly. Um, uh, uh, mer merrily after summer also, also seemed particularly apt. The other association and selection that, that struck me was Ray Charles's Georgia on my mind, which... which initially seemed to me to be particularly fitting and became even more so when I, when I looked at the uh, other guests who'd selected this, including uh, Maya Angelou, uh, Eric Clapton, Christian Barnard, Al although I became a little more disturbed about it when I saw that Jimmy Savile, Gary Glitter were, were also on the list who, who had chosen this and I decided to abandon that, uh, that, that analogy there. In, in, in any case, I've, I've already gone on too long, so I, so I think that uh, I'll, I'll simply sit back and call play. Before I start, I wanted to just say one thing about, um, about my contacts with C.L.R. James, which is that I did meet him a couple of times near the end of his life and talked to him, and I don't remember 
I don't think we talked for very long. I don't remember very much about it, though he was kind about my captaincy. But I think he... Uh, I did also, he asked me to write the foreword to one of the editions of Beyond the Boundary. So if you uh, have a particular edition of Beyond the Boundary, you might find my foreword in it. But then I also wanted to say that I wanted to thank somebody who's here, Clem Seacheron, for getting me to think more about C.L.R. James and also helping me or to think through some of the things about him. So, so I'd like to thank Clem very much for his help with this paper. So... C.L.R. James puts a challenge to us. What do they know of cricket who only cricket know? And the phrase uh, which he'd orig originally suggested as a title for the book is in effect a subtitle. The question can of course be generalised. What does one know of anything if one only knows that thing? And the phrase echoes Kipling's question, what do they know of England who only England know? In this talk I'm going to think about this question in my own terms and I'm going to link it with questions that Socrates asked, not the footballer by the way. <laughs> and uh, I'll consider how uh, James's question applies perhaps differently to players, to coaches or experts and to social historians like himself. And I'm then going to return to the book and give a more extensive account of how he, James, demonstrates that understanding cricket as he does, as he does, is enhanced by an understanding of social history and of the psychology of groups and of some other things. For instance, cricket could be the locus both of a deep prejudice and also a field in which such prejudice can be mitigated, even possibly overcome and reconciled. James also proves his own point in a broader sense. It's only by ambivalently going beyond boundaries. As a colonial, he was beyond the boundary of the British and admired the pride of the darker-skinned Shannon players. But at the same time, he was deeply imbued in British culture and affiliated himself with the paler Maple team in Trinidad. But it's only by such ambivalence that one can deepen one's knowledge. James was inherently subversive, not only against the British but against aspects of the anti-colonial movement. The book is, amongst other things, a celebration of the appointment in 1960 of the first black man's captain of the West Indies for a whole series. Frank Worrell, George Headley, the so-called Black Bradman, had captained West Indies, but only for a single test in 1948. As editor of the Trinidad newspaper The Nation, the mouthpiece of Dr. Eric Williams' People's National Movement, CLR had campaigned for this selection for two years, but Beyond a Boundary is far wider and more embracing than this. One way of characterising the book is that it offers an account of the significance of cricket for a whole society. He describes Grace as the most famous Englishman of the Victorian age, unifying the country in a way that nothing else and no one else could. Through him, quote, Cricket, the most complete expression of popular life in pre-industrial England, was incorporated into the life of the nation. In parallel to this, James shows how important the game was in the variedly coloured strata of Trinidad, how vital for the pride of the black man. It shows how success on the field for unprivileged individuals represented a victory over the colonial and class-ridden upper ranks, how such successes enabled the man and woman in the street to walk taller, to conceive that they had a right to regard themselves as the equals of those who set themselves up as their social superiors. They are no better than we, the great Trinidadian all-rounder, and the first black man in the House of Lords, Leary Constantine, said to James in the 1930s. And James himself wrote, the cricket field was a stage on which selected individuals played representative roles charged with social significance. Shannon, the team of the black lower middle class, best exemplified the unrelenting pursuit of excellence that the more or less level cricket playing field made possible. James showed how British values, including the idea of fair play, and to greater or lesser degrees, embodied it on the cricket field. He linked this value to the qualities of the English literature he studied at school and read at home 
in books sold by the itinerant bookseller whose impact on his life I'll come back to later. One might sum up beyond a boundary in terms James himself used. Something is required and someone steps in. This someone thereby breaks new ground. Close quote. The arrival of this someone is not a matter of pure chance. He also says, you wouldn't call Shakespeare or Michelangelo an accident. This last point is true, of Grace, of Worrell, and of James himself. But just as an aside, I suggest that his implication that there only has to be a requirement and then someone steps in is an overstatement, one that underplays the creativity of the person stepping in. On the one hand, it's true that the person who became Shakespeare arrived at a specific cultural situation and could not but emerge out of and address himself to that. When a breakthrough comes in science, the new thrust arrives as a response to certain scientific conundrums, perhaps even to a crisis in the science, where, as Thomas Kuhn puts it, the paradigms are breaking down, requiring too many special exemptions or complex arrangements to accommodate new discoveries and ideas. However, it would be wrong to think that there was only one route possible for, say, an Einstein or a Darwin or a Freud, or for Shakespeare, and this is also true of W.G. Grace, Frank Worrell, and C.L.R. James himself. That beyond a boundary could not have been written at any other point in history doesn't imply, imply that it had to be written or that only it could have been written. But to re return to my line of thought, the book is far richer than any simple summary could propose. The main point I want to make is that it itself is an example of its own epigraph or subtitle. James knows a lot more of cricket than only cricket, and it is his wider historical and social understanding that gives depth and force to his arguments about Worrell as to the book itself. And this is why Beyond a Boundary tells us so much about cricket. It is a radically new child of its time. On this occasion, it was true that cometh the hour, cometh the man. So, knowledge of cricket. James's question prompts the further question, what is knowledge of cricket? It's a Socratic question, inspired by Socratic irony. For the implication of the question is that the person most devoted and experienced in cricket, perhaps as a player or a coach or a commentator, doesn't, without other knowledge, know what cricket is. Such questioning was Socrates' mode of approach. He persuaded generals to admit their ignorance of what courage is, priests their ignorance about piety, rulers and judges about justice. At the end of each discussion or dialogue, the experts, reduced to perplexity by the Socratic examination, agree with his conclusion that no one knows what courage, piety or justice are, just as one might imagine someone uh, following James's question to the conclusion, no one knows what cricket is. Partly, this was an outcome arrived at by means of Socrates' logical sleight of hand. The fact that no definition of these complex concepts covers all cases doesn't entail that no one knows what these things are. Also, the fact that people can't put into words what something is doesn't mean they don't know what it is. As Wittgenstein said, Knowing what a clarinet sounds like doesn't involve being able to say so in words. But Socrates goes beyond this, forcing his interlocutors and us to realise how hard it is to be courageous, pious, just or virtuous. Like Kierkegaard, who says that in all Christianity there is no real Christian, Socrates challenges all ordinary claims to excellence or virtue. He raises questions that are more radical than the ordinary ones about our practical identities and roles. James doesn't go quite so far, but if we take his question seriously, we, like Socrates' generals and priests, have to interrogate our assumptions about knowledge of cricket and about what it takes to achieve excellence as a cricketer. There are different kinds of knowledge of cricket a range of different forms or levels of knowledge. There is first practical knowledge, knowing how, how to play, how to be a batsman, bowler, fielder. 
Second, there's the critical knowledge of a coach or commentator, including the making of discriminations and judgments and the spotting of talent. And third, James may have in mind a more reflective knowledge, being able to say what cricket's importance is, socially and psychologically, being able to relate cricket to other matters, as he does in Beyond a Boundary. But then, are the first two kinds of knowledge, the practical knowledge and the coach's knowledge, not really knowledge, or at any rate, knowledge of cricket? Are they somehow too limited to count as knowledge, unless lots of other things are thrown in? What does being practically knowledgeable or critically knowledgeable call for? So first I'll talk about the player's knowledge of cricket. Those in my first category, the players, may indeed be said to know cricket neither in the philosophical or comparative way evinced by James, nor in the overall way of the coach or co commentator. Yet surely we might protest. They understand it in a way that no one else does. Can anyone who's not been on the front line really know what war is like? I would say that even here, James has a point. For the player needs to understand more than his own particular niche or skill within a game. One thing I liked about the old pre- and post-war Yorkshire tradition in cricket was that players were brought up to think about the game as a whole. A typical Yorkshire team exemplified the old saying, however many people, so many opinions. By contrast, I heard a story that rather shocked me about an international bowler who was part of the fielding side in a recent one-day international. At the drinks break, it turned out that he had no idea of the situation of the game. He seemed not to know how many overs were left or what sort of run rate the opposition were faced with. All he could think of was whether his wrist was at exactly the correct angle in delivery. Thus, professionalism in sport may atrophy into a narrow focus on one's own task so that each player is imbued with guidelines about his own performance, based perhaps partly on technique, the angle of the wrist, and partly on computerised printouts telling him how to bowl against each opposition batsman, and such narrow knowledge is gained at the expense of an appreciation of and emotional involvement in the tactics of the game and or in the problems and skills of his teammates. He becomes a cog in the machine, a worker bee in a hive, rather than a thinking member of a team. In American football, teams change entire sections of their personnel when a defensive play is replaced by an offensive play, or vice versa. The division of labour is extreme. The role of the defensive linesman, say, can become so specialised and limiting that the person fulfilling it need know nothing at all about the play of or the overall strategy of the team. Such developments rob sportsmen of their humanity. No longer having to consider the process as a whole makes it impossible for them to understand how their own bit of the world makes sense. Like Chaplin in modern times, the defensive linesman becomes a conveyor belt attendant whose task is reduced to a small range of repeatable automated skills, like screwing the screw with the spanner. My own aim as captain of a cricket team, by contrast, was to turn players into a team of potential captains, of thinkers about the game. Individuals' responsibilities didn't cease when they weren't involved in their individual first-order skills of bowling or batting. I wanted them to be thinking about the whole situation, about each other's strengths, weaknesses, vulnerabilities and opportunities, as also about those in the opposition. They might then be able to offer advice or ideas to others or to the captain or to the team as a whole. No one in any organisation knows where the next good idea will come from. I believe too that the effort to see things from other people's points of view helps in the development of the individual's own skill. As a batsman, he can see the anxieties and doubts that even the best bowlers are subject to. As a bowler, he can appreciate the nervousness behind the strut even of the great batsman. Nor is batting or any other practical skill simply a matter of mastery of a technique in the abstract. A person who knows batting, say, in the sense of having an excellent technique, may not be a good batsman. 
he may not be good at turning technique into scores, or he may only do so when the pressure is off. A batsman, however skillful and correct, is not fully a batsman unless he can build an, inning, an innings, turn promising starts to big scores, fight his way through unpromising starts, and pace a run chase, unless he can perform when the chips are down against the best bowlers or in conditions which suit the bowler, unless he can early assess and convey to the team what a good score on a particular pitch might be, unless he has a reliable sense of when to risk his wicket in the interest of the team, and when, by contrast, to conserve his wicket, even if his performance then risks being misinterpreted in some quarters as selfishness. The excellent bowler, too, has to do more than bowl good balls. He can make the best of difficult circumstances, a pitch that doesn't suit him, or being put on at the wrong end, from his own point of view. Or he can make the worst, on the other hand, of a bad job. He's not intimidated by bowling to a destructive batsman. He'll stick at his task, even when the going is hard. Both batsmen and bowlers become more creative as craftsmen if they're open to developing a broader range of options. And all cricketers, like all sportsmen, have to deal with those twin imposters, success and failure. And some, of course, manage this difficult task much better than others. So, at this first level, what does a performer have to know in order to know his cricketing onions? The ideal player is capable of understanding more than how to hit a cover drive or bowl a fast outswinger. He who, in a narrow sense, only cricket, only cricketing technique, knows, is not going to be as good a player as he might be. He needs to be more broadly understanding, though not necessarily able to articulate, and he needs to be capable of a greater range of assessments. He needs to have strengths of character that go beyond flamboyant or exceptional technical ability. I think it's considerations like these that make sense of a striking attitude of those running Australian cricket a few years ago, when they were undoubtedly the best team in the world. John Buchanan and Steve Waugh, coach and captain, were convinced that improving the team's performance goes hand in hand with helping players to mature as people. So they adopted various ploys and approaches with this in view. En route to England for one tour, the team visited the scene of the loss of many Australian and other young lives in the First World War, the Dardanelles. Growing up as a cricketer includes realising that potential failings or losses in cricket pale into insignificance compared with losses of young life on the battlefield. Moreover, on these tours, players were encouraged to phone people at home whom they might have ignored. They were invited to read out to the rest of the team passages from books or from their own diaries that meant a lot to them. Uh, I can't resist making a couple of comments on this. First, that such broadening seems a far cry from the recent sacking of four players as the Australian management did in India, for not sending in a written homework assignment. <laughs> and second, the Steve Waugh approach to leadership did surprise me. I'd obviously had a limited understanding of the poetic and emotionally attuned world of the Australian dressing room. It, it, it wasn't how they talked to me. <laughs> These leaders recognise the truth in James's assertion that those who know nothing of life cannot learn what they need to know and need to have inside them if they're to reach their full potential as cricketers, however talented and committed. And clearly, such a lesson applies to activities beyond cricket and sport. So now the second category, the expert, the coaches, the commentators, managers, people like that. What about these people in this category, people experienced in the game at various stages, now perhaps using their expertise in working as coaches, umpires, commentators, or in other ways? A person may, as Ranjit Sinji put it in 1898, and it reminded me of some, what some, one of you here said last night about getting into a queue at Sainsbury's and arriving at the head of the queue and saying to the girl on the till, um, 
when I joined this queue, I didn't have a single grey hair in my head. But anyway, that's beside the point. Um, Ranjit Sinji said uh, that some people grow grey in the service of the game and know nothing, learn nothing. But I'm not talking about such people, the narrow or the bigoted or the unimaginative. I'm talking about people who themselves excelled as players and are rooted in the game, in its techniques, its law, its values, its character, and the characters of those playing it. I'm not meaning to imply that only people with top-level experience and expertise can become good coaches, pundits, and so on, but I do think that some of the most perceptive in these categories are ex-players who devoted a lifetime to the game. So you might think that they know much beyond cricket. Once they've retired, in their mid-30s or early 40s, they've gone into coaching or commentary or umpiring. I'm thinking of people like the Chapel Brothers, Ray Ellingworth, Keith Fletcher, Sunil Gavaskar, Michael Holding, Michael Atherton, Geoffrey Boycott, Graham Gooch, Peter Willey, steeped in the practice and observation of the game and its players. In what sense might one say that these people know only cricket and therefore don't know cricket? An expert of this kind can know cricket through and through without understanding its actual and potential social role. They may not have much to say about Grace's role in English social history or even about Worrell and his place in colonial and post-colonial West Indian history. However, such men understand a lot that goes beyond cricket simply conceived. They know about character, they know about relaxation and concentration, about pressure and responses to it. These experts know the game tactically and psychologically as well as technically. They're shrewd in their assessment of who to pick or who can be relied on in a crisis. In their day-to-day -day coaching, they constantly be switching between, on the one hand, talking to players at a technical level, and on the other, making suggestions or opening up discussions about matters of character and personality, and indeed emotion. An old coach in his 90s said to me once, noticing how tense I was, why did I frown when playing imaginary shots in the pavilion with his walking stick, which he'd given to me in place of a bat, which I might have done better with? He said, well, play, play, a, couple of, play a couple of shots. And there I was, sort of frowning, you see. He said, did I think I'd hit the ball harder by frowning? He was questioning my un unacknowledged assumption that doing well is based on trying harder, which itself seemed to imply at least to me at that moment, a sort of rigidly tense effort at concentration. In fact, one can't hit a ball well when one's body is tense or one's hands are tight. The coach understood all this. He might have approached my problem from a purely technical point of view, about the grip, the position of the hand. But he didn't. He got me to think about what my underlying and largely unconscious belief was so that having seen how wrong-headed and wrong-bodied it was, I could orient myself differently. Graham Gooch, England's batting coach, says that what he coaches is not batting, but run scoring. By which I think he means it's not so much technique as the whole approach to batting, so that the batsman gets used to making big scores or recovering from bad patches. Gooch is coaching more than batting per se. With experienced test players, he has a relatively small amount of work to do on technique alone. But there may be much that can be tweaked psychologically in terms of attitude and approach with regard to motivation and passion. There was a lot to be learned, James reminds us, from Shannon. Gooch and others understand risk and safety in both teams and individuals. The true coach or leader understands people, knows what makes them tick. He recognises the importance of personal qualities and draws on intangible and hard-to-describe sources of ambition and dedication in members of the team, including proper pride, that which motivated West Indian teams during their glory days, and which to some degree, some significant degree, lay behind their utter determination to be the best. The coach or journalist may not express such knowledge in James's fluent prose, but it would be there in their attitudes. 
like a good parent or teacher. They know something about the balance between telling and consulting, about the need for respect for others' opinions while holding on to one's own. James has a good point here too. Knowing cricket and cricketers does call for knowledge of more than cricket's technicalities, though one might say all this is involved in knowing cricket, of course. Knowledge in a practical activity like cricket involves levels of understanding that go beyond the acquisition of or the capacity to convey or sum up technical skills. Such understanding involves a sense of self and of others. It includes a capacity to grasp or sum up a game as a whole. This general point has application far beyond cricket or sport. I imagine that in your various roles and jobs there are always other skills and understandings required beyond the narrowly technical ones of your professions or work. We have a good idea, let's say, but can we get it across? We have particular skills, but can other people tolerate us being part of their team? Can we match with others in a cooperative way? On the Radio 3 programme Private Passions not long ago, Rowan Williams, as you know, was recently Archbishop of Canterbury, spoke about what was called for in being a chorister. He said, and I'll paraphrase, that it involves not only technical improvements in singing and following a score, but also learning how to listen and respond to other voices, to be in conversation with others, holding on to one's own line of music or point of view, but also, at the same time, hearing and responding to the others. On the cricket field, in choirs, in other teams or group, if we put others off too much or too radically, they won't want to hear what we have to say, but if we can listen to them at the same time as keep our own voices, we may be able to contribute very significantly to the whole team. James quotes Worrell, by the way, in this context, near the end of the book. If something was wrong, this is Worrell, I told them what was right and left it to them. One element in leadership, then, is transmitting understanding or even knowledge and then leaving it to somebody else. The psychoanalyst and psychiatrist Tom Main, who led the Castle Hospital in London during the 1950s and 60s, was once asked by a frantic young psychiatrist what he should do with a particularly difficult and demanding patient. Main listened to the doctor, was silent for a while, and then said, don't just do something, stand there. Next thing I want to talk about is focus and scale, tactics and strategy. One skill that we need as players and as leaders is the capacity to move between a narrow and a wide focus. In the Middlesex team, which I captained for 12 years, the person I went to for advice about what to do next or right now was usually Clive Radley. He was perceptive, down-to-earth, pragmatic, laconic. Moreover, if I didn't follow his suggestion and things went wrong, he'd still be open to my request for help an hour or a day later, which not everyone is, I can tell you. He was the perfect person to check out immediate plans with, and he had clear, brief, blunt ideas himself. Mike Smith, another senior player, was very different. He was less direct, he was more vague or indecisive when it came to what to do now, but he had insightful suggestions on wider issues, such as which younger players looked as if they had real class, what the balance of the team should be, what were the longer prospects of a side. He was more reflective, almost, one might say, more philosophical. He was a strategist, while Radley was a tactician. A third player, Roland Butcher, was even more or differently wide-ranging in what he was capable of noticing. He was more like a psychoanalyst to the team. I remember two comments he made, and these were in The Art of Captaincy. One was when I called a team meeting after we'd lost four games on the trot, immediately after winning the first 11 completed matches in the season. And in the meeting, many people voiced their opinions, including me, and several of these opinions were perfectly sensible and to the point. But late in the discussion, Roland said something like this. I think we've started to count the trophies that we assume we'll have on our mantelpieces at home at the end of the season. We're speaking as if we've only got to turn up to the ground to win. Our attitude has become complacent, 
totally different from what it was early in the season. We need to stop thinking about the distant future and the trophies on the mantelpiece and once again concentrate on each ball, each over, each session. On another occasion, when I was unhappy about the tendency of some players to sulk when they'd been dropped or when they felt they weren't being given the prominence that was their due, Roland came in with, Yes, but do you appreciate what it feels like to be left out of this side? One minute you're part of the setup, the next minute you're changing in a side room down the corridor and no one talks to you in the same way. No wonder, he might have added, one or two people are prone to sulk. So here are three valuable contributions, none more or less useful than any of the others. For a full understanding of a team at work, one would need each kind of intelligence, each kind of contribution, pragmatic, strategic, psychological. Socrates, or Plato, with their elevation of abstract intellect, might have placed the three in a hierarchy, Butcher, or possibly Smith, on top, and then Radley at the bottom. A modern professional player or coach might reverse that order. I see them as having equivalent weight. Sometimes one needs more of one than the other, but all are needed. It's rather as if one were to ask which kind of scale is of most value in a map, or indeed which kind of map. I see on the stairs coming up in this building there's a, there are physical maps of Scotland, uh, and then there's a, um, a political or a uh, a social map of Scotland, not a political one, a, a, a map that shows roads and conurbations. And one needs each kind of map, and one needs different kinds of scales. The answer about scale is, it depends on what you need at the moment. The closer the map is to a replica of the environment, the less it becomes a map, but also the more detail one can see. The smaller the scale, the more one sees one's route in relation to other places, other journeys, but the less detail one can pick up. Sometimes one needs one kind of map, sometimes another. The microscope and the telescope. Minute particulars and panoptic vision. Each complements the other. Perhaps there's an analogy here to the traditional values of professionalism and amateurism. The typical professional knows the game close too. He has to. His living depends on it. He has to put in time at the technicalities. He practices and trains assiduously. The old pro can read a pitch, since he's seen similar and different pitches over many years. He knows cricket from having played in and watched, games played in a wide variety of conditions of pitch and atmosphere. He has ideas of how to combat a wide range of opposition. The amateur may be less acquainted, less closely acquainted with the detail, but at best he plays with a spontaneity that comes from a love of the activity. He can, we hope, take risks. He can try new methods and be more independent. His livelihood doesn't depend on it. He can relax. He has other things in life, so cricket can be seen as not the be-all and end-all of life. Failure is not perhaps so devastating. I mean, these are obviously stereotypes of the old form of amateur and professional. James himself is keen to emphasise the need for new vision, for attitudes that transcend the conventions of the day, whether in sport, art, politics or life. Here's a quote from him summarising the views of Fritz Stamfel, the trainer of athletes such as Bannister, Chataway, Brescia and others. And the quote is, By far the most important part of a great performance is played by the mind. Once the athlete is convinced that the prevailing standards, like the four-minute mile, are not high, as improving upon them is not a very difficult task, he'll crack them. Long hours of training are not in the least necessary. Amazing. The record breaker of the future will be a man of intelligence with an imaginative approach. It's a very one-sided view. The greatest performances will be produced by the poet, the artist and the philosopher. Now, I'd say that both sets of qualities, professional and amateur, philosophical and pragmatic, are invaluable and need to be held in balance. And in fact, one of the problems of life is holding the different tensions and antinomies of life in balance, including these. In, the pa in fact, of course, my point should really be made in terms of attitudes and temperaments, rather than differences related to whether or not one is paid to play. 
There are plenty of people who did not and did not need to get paid to play cricket, whose approach was of the former kind and vice versa. Think of Trevor Bailey's batting, the amateur who batted like a caricature of the professional, and Colin Milburn's, the professional who batted like the proverbial amateur. Think of the two professionals, Gooch, who emphasised work, training, practice and dedication, and was a wonderful test match batsman. And David Gower, elegant, lazy, hating training, no time for practice, with an ironical attitude which could at times veer over into the lackadaisical, but his batting was a delight of timing and touch. An analogy. I'm talking to you about cricket, and you're not primarily cricketers, most of you hunt. Uh, yet I assume that what I'm saying will have echoes and resonances with your own situations, and I'll come back to this point later. The analogy I want to end this section with is this. I read recently of Mozart's support for democracy, not in politics, but in the music of his operas. How so? Mozart gave his minor parts complex characters with complex music. They're not simply pawns, either in the plot, the content, or in the music they're given to sing, the form. He shifted music away from a hierarchical tradition. His music gave each instrument and voice a unique line of its own, rather than relying on a totally dominant top line with others in unison beneath it, supplementing, harmonizing, fitting in. In short, serving the dominant tune. As in psychoanalysis, there's a democracy of potential significance finders. Free association gives a, particularly, a potentially equal place to all productions of the mind. And I'm saying this about teams and about individuals too. So now, what else do they who know cricket also know? I'm not, and now I'm thinking about, about James. I nearly said Henry James just then. He was, also had a complex mind. What do they know of cricket who only cricket know? And what were these other areas of knowledge that deepened and broadened James's own knowledge of cricket? What embedded his kind of knowledge of cricket? And I'm, f I'm going to focus mainly on the first chapter of his book, where he seeks out his own roots, which were clearly planted and were even bearing fruit in the first decade of his life. Of prime importance for him is the place of cricket in the life of the society. On the very first page, we see the six-year-old boy staying with his grandmother and two aunts in Tunapuna, the small town eight miles outside Port of Spain. He's, he writes, like all towns and villages on the island, it possessed a recreation ground. Recreation meant cricket. For in those days, except for occasional athletic sports meetings, cricket was the only game. So cricket was the only game, and the ground was at the centre of the community. Later, James describes the death of his older aunt, Judith. She'd prepared, as usual, a feast for the annual match organised by her son. When she sat down and said, I'm not feeling so well, she leant her head on the table. When they bent over her to find out what was wrong, she was dead. James writes, I thought it appropriate that her death should be so closely associated with a cricket match. Yet, he continues, she had never taken any particular interest in cricket. She or my grandmother or my other aunt would come in from the street and say, Matthew Bonman made 55, or Arthur Jones is still batting. But that was all. My point is, even for women who were not particularly interested in cricket, it was central to the culture of the time and place, and this must have been what made it, in James's view, appropriate for her to die when and where she did. Standing on a chair in the bedroom in this house of his grandmother's, the young boy could watch practices and matches on the Tunapuna re Recreation Ground from behind the bowler's arm. Here was, quotes, shaped one of my strongest early impressions of personality in society. And there follows a brief description of the neighbour, Matthew Bonman, a ne'er-do-well, an awful character, generally dirty, would not work, an almost perpetual snarl, he would often, without shame, walk up the main street barefooted, with his planks on the ground, 
as my grandmother would report. But Matthew had one saving grace. Matthew could bat. More than that, Matthew, so crude and vulgar in every aspect of his life, with a bat in his hand, was all grace and style. And his mother's, his grandmother's, James's grandmother's oft-repeated verdict on Matthew, good for nothing except to play cricket, puzzled James. How could a person's ability at cricket make up for his abominable way of life? James goes on to quote an 18th century account of the great cricketer William Beldum. Quotes, It was a study for Phidias, the Greek sculptor, sculptor, to see Beldum rise to strike. Men's hearts throbbed within them, their cheeks turned pale and red. Michelangelo should have painted him. Thus James's childhood passion for cricket touches quickly not only on sociology, the centre of the town, universal interest shown even his, in his aunt's casual knowledge, but also on aesthetics, especially as revealed in classical Greece and in the Renaissance. He refers to the impact of Matthew's batting. A long, low ah came from many a spectator, and my own little soul thrilled with recognition and delight. Phidias and Michelangelo should have sculpted Beldum's cut shot, which the 18th century cricket writer lyricises. So understanding cricket at James's level includes seeing its place in society and knowing on one's pulses its aesthetic appeal. From the same bedroom chair, the young James could mount onto the windowsill and so stretch a groping hand for the books on the top of the wardrobe. This too we learn on the first page, and his interest in books, and especially in English literature, is described soon after. His mother was a reader, one of the most tireless I have ever known. Usually it was novels, any novel. My mother's tastes in novels was indiscriminate, but I learnt discrimination from my father. And there was the itinerant bookseller, who came once a fortnight, carrying a huge pack on his shoulders. Side by side with the child's growing obsession with cricket books and articles was another, Thackeray's Vanity Fair. My mother had an old copy with a red cover. I'd read it when I was about eight, and of all the books that passed through that house, this one became my Homer and my Bible. Even his analogies are interesting. I read it through from the first page to the last, then started again, read to the end, and started again. He'd read it 20 times by the time he was about 15, I think he says, I can't remember. Along with this novel were biblical influences, pamph pamphlets found on the top of the wardrobe, their themes or references later explore, explored more thoroughly in the many Bibles that lay about the house, including the large one with the family births and deaths. Somewhere along the way, he writes, I must have caught the basic rhythms of English prose. My reading was chiefly in the Old Testament, and may I, I may have caught, too, some of the stern attitude to life which was all around me, tempered, but only tempered, by family kindness. Certainly I must have found the same rhythms and the same moralism when I came to Vanity Fair. So, along with social significance and aesthetic appeal, we find here a third and fourth pillar of James's upbringing, the aspects of the culture that he internalised and that became significant in his personal understanding of cricket. Literature and Puritan values as found and expressed in the Bible and in his family influences. Rhythms and grace of expression and a serious morality and attitude to life, both exemplified in the cricketer and cricketers he admired. Finally, the last route, pride. I'm reminded of his story of his maternal grandfather, Joshua Rudder, which you probably remember, being called in when retired to repair the cane-crushing engine that had broken down at the crucial crop-cutting time. His grandfather asked to go in alone. Within two minutes he was out, and the big wheels started to revolve again. All wanted to know how he'd done it. James writes, The always exuberant Josh grew silent for once and refused to say. He never told them. He never told anybody. The obstinate old man wouldn't even tell me. But when I asked him that day, why did you do it? He said, they were white men, with all their big degrees, and it was their business to fix it. 
I had to fix it for them. Why should I tell them? And this brings me back to the cricket pride of Shannon, the team of black lower middle classes in Trinidad, the team of the Constantines, the great Leary and his father Lebrun, and the St. Hills. How much integrity was needed, how much maturity and confidence to find this route to self-respect in so deeply prejudiced and unjust a world, uh, especially with the history. The achievement included, I would say, neither kowtowing nor rebelling with a violence or stupidity that could have set back the cause of the very fair play so admired on the cricket field itself. What happened within the boundary would profoundly shape what happened beyond the boundary, but by the same time, token, what was learned in life was carried over the boundary onto the cricket field. Cricket is a social phenomenon, at times the expression of racial superiority, but also and at other times the expression of racial pride and renewal. In its range and range of skills, it evinces an aesthetic power. It can be an arena for the exercise of values of truth and honesty, as implied in the old dictum, it's not cricket, however much these values are and always have been under threat. James's old national campaign for the appointment of Frank Worrell as captain of the national team, especially for series against Australia and England, was based on these underlying themes and understandings, was given its power and its intellectual underpinning by them. Cricket is understood in its deeper currents only if one can bring in art, politics, sociology and psychology. Religion too may play its part. It's remarkable to my mind how much West Indian cricket has achieved over the decades, thanks partly to the legacy of the likes of James in one sphere and the Constantines and Worrell in another. The latter took this quaint British game that has so much that is good in it and made it their own, playing it in their inimitable style, or rather, styles. As James said in Mike Dibb's film, um, which I think you've, well, many of you will have seen now, uh, Caliban, by which I mean myself or Frank Worrell, had to find quality qualities, had to venture into fields that Caesar never knew. So I've mentioned five routes for how James's knowledge of cricket, five other areas enabling him to surpass knowing only cricket, his appreciation of its social place, its aesthetics, its links to art and, their, uh, art and literature and their values, its moral place and its roles in politics. James himself reduces these to three, social relations, politics and art. He suggests that they'd earlier come together under the aegis of Thomas Arnold and his then revolutionary idea of edu education as initiated at rugby school in the 19th century. These ideals were still valid and practiced in James's own schooling at Queen's Royal College, Port of Spain, Spain. And I'll quote this passage more fully. James. It's only within very recent years that Matthew Bonman and the cutting of Arthur Jones ceased to be merely isolated memories and fell into place as starting points of a connected pattern. They only appear as starting points. In reality, they were the end, the last stones put into place, of a pyramid whose base constantly widened until it embraced those aspects of social relations, politics and art laid bare when the veil of the temple has been rent in twain as ours has been. And I think that division, which suggests the ambivalence I mentioned earlier, is important. So he was always having to move between one side of the boundary and the other, and indeed outside beyond those boundaries too. So just in conclusion, briefly, Beyond a Boundary is one of the best books written on cricket, which itself is an activity and a tradition that's been rich enough to inspire some of the best of sports writing even if it wasn't rich enough to pay me £3,000 25 years ago. <laughs> its author both describes and shows through his own thinking how broader ideas can enrich one's understanding and appreciation of something as apparently constricted or limited as sport, or one particular sport. James shows how a whole universe of culture lies behind and sustains the evolution of cricket in the West Indies and elsewhere, and how in its turn the game is able to bear myriad responsibilities with which it's been saddled historically in England and in the old empire. C.L.R. James manifests brilliantly his own conception of the richness and fluidity 
of knowledge. One has to go beyond a boundary to understand cricket and its complex place in society and in the mind. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for such a rich, wide-ranging talk. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I was immediately struck by many things, including that, that near slip of the tongue and the conflation of Henry James and, and C.L.R. James. And I, my, my first thought there was that uh, Henry was much more interested in golden bowls than golden ducks. But beyond that, you know, he, he was also a writer who, who <coughs> was fascinated in not, not only boundaries, but in the possibilities of going beyond them. Uh, and can I say, and between, <laughs> it just occurs to me, um, Europe and America. Exactly, yes. And, and, the, mm -hmm. and the two worlds and the, and the influence, mutual influence on each and the conflicts and tensions between and what you gain in one and losing in it and what you gain in the other and losing it. Mm -hmm. so which actually echoes more than I realised. Yeah, yes, well, well it's exactly what I was mm, thinking sorry, too. Yeah, yeah. You know, that, that yeah. a novel like uh, that The Princess Casamassima is very CLR Jamesian in its emphasis on the importance of anonymous work. Uh, and, and that's relation to other structures. Uh, the only mention of cricket that I can think of immediately in, in Henry James is, is in What Maisie Knew, a novel that's also marked very interestingly in terms of this conversation in, in that it features as what one of its principal characters, a woman who's repeatedly described as being brown. Uh, in, in, in any case, uh, uh, we, we have time now for, for questions. I wonder what you think, given the period we live in today, there seems to be in so many ways a real dislike or degradation of the idea of having a big picture in you know, what you do or in education or in politics. You know, we live in such an anti-political age or even in philosophy or history where we, the idea of a grand narrative uh, and all the rest of it, those things have become unfashionable. I wonder the extent to which the idea of having that big picture is also, you mentioned it in a couple of ways in relation to sport, but does that impact on sport? You know, that idea that having the big picture, a broader understanding of society or of your team that you bring to what you do is problematised and whether there is, which I find in education, an instrumentalism that mm -hmm. is in, in fact degrades the potential mm -hmm. of that idea. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Uh, my name is Walter Persaud. I am from Thailand, Mahidol University. My question is about the interface between critical knowledge and self-knowledge, or I think what you call reflective knowledge. I would wonder how you would understand psychological forces such as pride, anger, fear in West Indian political liberation and the uh, and our personal liberation from these as batsmen and bowler. Are these levels of libera liberation attained in the same way? Do we think that West Indian cricket has placed too much emphasis on political liberation and in the great days of West Indian cricket and that that has in some ways undermined our personal liberations that we have to uh, deal with as batsmen and bowler. Thank you. My name is George Corby. I'm from Montreal. I'm born in Belmont, Trinidad, near to the Queen's Park, near the, to the Queen's Park Savannah. But what I like to say that James, that he had a deja vu seen in Roy Gilchrist that he saw in Matthew the Bondman. And when you speak about attitude and temperament, did, did Worrell try to cultivate attitude and temperament in Roy Gilchrist, which Alexander could not do? I'll come back to the first one later, but th those two last questions I think go together a bit because what you're both talking about, how does one develop, both in oneself and in other people, personal qualities that can be contributory to what to, to, to the aim and the aspiration of your craft or skill, let's say as a bowler or as a batsman. You, you're saying, does the emphasis on political liberation interfere with this personal liberation, which is what you're talking about, isn't it? 
personal liberation in the sense of freeing someone from certain ways of responding that, li that are rep repetitive and emotional and limit their development. I'm not sure that I understand, and maybe you have to tell me a bit more about how po what, what this emphasis on political liberation meant in the context of the West Indies cricket team. I mean, I, I, I know that it became a, a team for the whole of the Caribbean at the same time that there were the individual countries uh, with their own governments and so forth. And that I know the, the, the University of the West Indies also had that quality of... If I could just quote, you know, or paraphrase what Vivian Richard said. He said that when he went out to bat, he was batting, he felt he was representing yes. oppressed peoples everywhere. And that seems to me that it was motivated by a sense of not just what he needed to do in cricket, yes. but a sense of injustice. Yes. Uh, motive, yes. Uh, you yes. know, um, yes. uh, with memories of, of uh, lost pride and sure. indignity and, sure. and, and, and also fear of not being able to do that. Yeah. Well, I see, I can see actually how that can be both a personal liberation and it can be an oppression, something that sits on your shoulders. Uh, I can see how, on the one hand, and I think this is undoubtedly true for Viv Richards, it didn't do him much harm as a player to have that. <laughs> and, and indeed, when he walked out to bat, he, more than any other cricketer I ever played against, or with for that matter, induced fear in the opposition. I mean, he induced apprehension. I knew very fine bowlers who did not want to bowl at Viv. And it wasn't just because he was such a good player, it was because of the whole impression he conveyed, as he, even as he walked out to the crease. He could play a forward defensive shot that, uh, that conveyed unspeakable contempt for the bowler. <laughs> 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 hmm. uh, and, 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 you know, he conveyed that he could be playing this with his eyes shut and still be playing it with the middle of the bat against this particular bowler. And bowlers felt it, and teams felt it, and they quaked before him. Somebody asked me, how did I captain a team against the West Indies? Well, I didn't do it very often, thanks to great shrewdness, but, <laughs> but um, it was with fear and trepidation, was my answer. But, but, but um, so proper pride was what I was talking about, and that can be a, an important part of the development of one's skill in any walk of life and from any background. I mean, it doesn't need to be from the West Indies with its particular colonial and slavery history. It doesn't have to be. It can be from a family in the East End, or it can be from someone in the Gorbals, or it can be for, from anyone, anywhere. At the same time, if you, every time you go out to bat, you're batting not only for yourself, but the, for the whole of the oppressed people of the world. Mm -hmm. That can be a very big burden on someone lesser than Viv, Viv Richards. And it, you may be right that for those, for, for, you know, that was a hard act to follow or to live up to. And it may be one of the elements of, of the decline of West Indies between the early 1990s and recently. Um, though I think there must be other elements which may also be relate, related to politics and to the difficulty of administration and the, the, the weakness of the board and the conflict between board and players and the failure to negotiate properly and to talk to each other about what's going on and, and the difficulty in you know, a person's individual aims um, as administrators as opposed to the whole interest of the whole team. So, you know, which again comes back to cricket and sport and all the rest of it. The development of the personality, you know, to deal, to, to channel fear and anger as well as possible, which James tried to help Gilchrist with, uh, without going over the top and uh, behaving outrageously or behaving against the, the, the values of the whole activity seemed to be a very important part of what he did. And as you say, he could do it with Gilchrist, whereas Alexander could not. And he understood him better and he was closer to him. And he was probably just a, a more tactful, probably a bigger person. You know. Derek Murray, whom I know a bit and played against, and a bit with actually in the, in the 60s and 70s, Derek Murray says he was the greatest man and captain he knows, you know and he played with him for many years. But to come back to your point about instrumentalism, I think it's a very good point indeed. And I think of it in education, and I think of it in psych psychotherapy. CBT, we have a, a CBT says, what is your problem? Na label your problem, find a good, s quick solution for it, work on it in a few easy stages, 
and you solve your problem. Look at the problem narrowly like that. And, 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 and with some people and for some things, that can help. But contrast it with psychoanalysis, which looks at the problem in the biggest context you can of the whole personality of the person. Now, not everyone can have psychoanalysis, and not everyone wants it, uh, even if they could have it. And um, so I'm not saying it's a, it's a cure-all, but I'm saying it's at the other end of other pole of, of, the, of the extreme. And, and education can co- become incredibly and narrowly, obsessively detailed and fact-laden and um, boring and repetitive and learning things, as opposed to thinking for yourself and placing something in the widest, wider context. And of course, placing something in a wide context can be woolly and can be escaping from hard work. It can be thinking you can do all things by intuition. So it's, it's a constant tension, like the tension between uh, batting and practice and batting and spontaneity, or the philosopher as a coach for sportsmen and the technician as a sports for coach. You need both. And I think we have swung a long, a long way in one direction recently. I agree with you. Neil Washbourne, Leeds Met- Metropolitan University. Uh, Mike, I wonder if I can get you to reflect a little bit upon you as a six-year-old boy. Uh, kind of what were the things that went into the formation, like a variety of things went into the formation of James, at least in that account. Yes. What range of things made this a seductive kind of thing to go into or an interesting thing to go into? I wanted to raise two points, Mike. First off, the connection between Vanity Fair, uh, Homer and the Bible, um, which James makes as part of telling a story. It's, it's quite interesting to me because um, subsequent work has looked at the connection between cricket classics and Christianity, as um, I'm paraphrasing somebody, part of the, the baggage which colonial administrators took out with them to places like the West Indies. But it's interesting that to speak about cricket classics and Christianity as part of an ideological baggage is to use a social, scientific, and historical language. And of course, James elegantly accomplishes uh, making that connection through his personal narrative, which I think tells us something very interesting about what you can do with narrative um, much more elegantly and perhaps persuasively than you can using more abstract categories. Um, I just want to ask about take your expertise on leadership, and uh, James also wrote a lot, uh, lot about leadership, not just in the cricket field, but also, also in the political realm. I just wondered what you thought of, uh, of his ideas on leadership and whether um, they, were con- they were consistent when discussing politics and what went on in the cricket field as well. I mean, just to take the last question first, I, I don't really know enough about um, his views on, on, on political, political leaders. What he says about Worrell, the, what, the thing that I quote about of, of him saying about Worrell is that I told them what was right and then left it to them. And I think there's an interesting thing there that you can, as a parent or a politician or a leader, you can talk too much and, and keep on too much. You can hammer somebody with something. Just to risk a slightly personal remark, not, not personal, but comment, um, Jeffrey Boycott has very wise things to say about cricket, but he, ke- he says them too frequently. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and one gets the feeling that, that it's, being, you're being, it's, being, it's being driven at you. And, you know, some mothers, some fathers can do this. They can, they can drive things. Some analysts and therapists, some teachers can do it. So they can drive things into people, and they feel that there's not enough room for them for their own points of view. And they have to rebel, actually, against that if they're to find any authenticity. I mean, we all have to rebel, but the rebellion might have to be more extreme or more desperate in some of those cases. So um, that point itself, and I'm sort of echoing the point, the question, the point that was made by that gentleman there about uh, Gilchrist. I suppose with Gilchrist also, there was something about Gilchrist could not bear to disappoint Worrell. He would rather bowl half volleys in that somebody said he played in a charity match of some sort. I, I think it was in this book, isn't it? In Beyond the Boundary. He played in a charity match and he went, or a, a not serious, not a particularly serious match, and bowled to some amateur who was playing. And he bowled a series of half volleys and got hit for four after four rather than risk Worrell's disappointment or disapproval. So there's something about a man whose judgment is clear but who isn't judgmental. 
which is kind of a, a difficult knack to achieve. And I suspect that there was something of that in his idea of leadership, which I, I think is very important and very hard to achieve, to reach. Now, um, the question of me as a six-year-old, I mean, the thing that strikes me most, most about that is that, um, is that my father was a very good cricketer and sportsman. And, and he was a Yorkshireman. In fact, went to Leeds University, lived in Heckmondwike, went to university because he was the eighth of eight children. And, but, and his father was, reminded me of um, Joshua Rudder because he was an engine fitter in the mills. And by the time the eighth child reached 16 or 17, the older children were earning money. And so there was a, he could stay on at school and he could get a scholarship to Leeds University and go and play cricket at Leeds University and play for the for Yorkshire seconds and once for Yorkshire first and twice for Middlesex first when he went to London afterwards. So when I was growing up he was playing cricket every weekend and I was following him around and getting him to bowl at me in the back garden and bowling at him and playing catch and all the rest of it. And so it was undoubtedly something that I, you know, he liked and appreciated and I grew up with. And also being a Yorkshire, it's part of what I was indicating when I said I like that old Yorkshire attitude is he always had an opinion not only about batting and bowling but about tactics and strategy. I mean, he had an opinion about what, why was he bowling with this field? Or why was so-and-so on now and not somebody else? And so that was something that was kind of part of my cricketing upbringing from the beginning. I mean, from, I mean, from four or five or six. And I used to play... But there was the other interesting thing was I supported Middlesex since I was in West London and Lords was not far away. Though I didn't go there until I was about eight or nine, I think. But I supported Middlesex, and when I was seven, um, they had the season when um, Compton scored 3,000, you'll be able to tell me, 800 runs? Or? And, and, and Edrich scored... 3,539. Thank you. <laughs> and, and Jack Robertson scored... 2,589. <laughs> I, I didn't need to bring my wisdom anyway. And my hero was Jack Robertson. And it interests me why that should have been. Jack Robertson, classical, opening batsman, very fine player, but not a, Robert, not a Compton or an Edrich, and not that sort of player. And in fact, I became an opening batsman for Middlesex and England. And I, my career average was, I think, 37 or 38 point something, and so was Robertson's. And it does seem very, very odd to me that I should kind of model myself unconsciously on a person whose play was not flamboyant in the way of the others, but was good. I mean, it was sound and good. Perhaps because of my father, but also because well, what was it about Jack Robertson that I picked up from that very early age? So there's something about, you know, lack of outrageous or or uh, great self-confidence or the self-confidence to do something extravagant uh, but a sort of interest in some sort of classical control organised, some sort of orthodoxy, the whole balance between orthodoxy and spontaneity and experiment of sort of innovation are very interesting in sport as in other areas of life. So that's what I'll limit to you. And when I was nine, my mother said to me, disapprovingly, if you go on like this the rest of your life, you'll do nothing but play cricket or football. <laughs> and she was sort of almost half right. Um, now, the question of classics, Christianity, vanity, literature, the Bible, and sport, and, 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 and the use of narrative. I've got a sort of association to narrative, which is not necessarily those kinds of narratives, but narrative. That I agree with you that narrative is a fantastically important part of education, of growing up, of identification finding oneself, who does one identify with in particular narratives, just like what I've just said now about Jack Robertson, that's a sort of story that was told and I would pick up and would tell myself not in so many words, obviously about who this man was and who I might be now that seems to me to be um, an interesting narrative and the link of the self to the narrative and of course it's much more sophisticated if you have literary narratives that you read and Vanity Fair, the Homer, the Bible. Homer, incidentally, I just want to give one quote from Homer that I love, which is that Homer said at one point that sin goes racing around the world doing harm. Uh, young, 
vigorous and energetic. And it's followed by prayer, halt, lame and wrinkled, trying to put things right. And <laughs> I don't know why I think of that, but anyway, yeah, I think of that. But yes, yeah, so, so, so James's narratives that formed him, that obviously struck him from the itinerant book seller and the books on top of the wardrobe, and from Vanity Fair, the Bible, the biblical tracts, and then from the cricketing biographies and accounts he read, they obviously were internalized by him complexly. I mean, it wasn't that he only had those narratives, and he had to argue against them in a way, you know, because I think he was ambivalent, as Clem Citroen has sort of helped me to see, the ambivalence towards the European as, a po as opposed to, let's say, the African roots in him or the specifically West Indian roots. And, and I think he probably struggled with that. And one might even say that Beyond a Boundary was a kind of a, and, and his, uh, his, his conciliation with Larry Constantine of Shannon might have been his, out, partly out of his guilt for his moving towards the lighter skin maple and his, his tremendous affinity for uh, Western cultural values and, and these values of, of, of um, Thomas Arnold and, and his school teachers from Cambridge and Oxford in the early 1900s. When did you first read this book? Because you would have been an undergraduate at Cambridge when it was published. I just wondered, when did it really start to influence your thinking? Not then. <laughs> I mean, it was much later. I don't know, I was probably in my 30s. Um, well, I was, because, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, uh, as I say, I read that introduction to it or forward to it which m I don't know what year that was, but it might have been about 1980 or around that time. Given what we've been talking about, um, particularly with Richards earlier, um, was there a sense when you were playing a test match against the West Indies, particularly that summer of 76, that you were up against people who wanted to win more than you did mm -hmm. and how much that affected your outlook on the game and you, and, you, know, you weren't a captain at that particular time, but as a player, how much that affected your performance? Well, two things. One is that it was my first test match. So I hadn't played a test match before. I didn't, I was really, a, I was a newcomer to the whole scene as well as to the West Indies. Um, I don't think we thought of it that way. And then, you know, I think we did think with West Indies and at that time Australia, that there was something that they both shared, which was perhaps had a little corner of something to do with the old empire. You know, I mean, I'm not sure I would have put it in so many words, but it had a corner of these people had been treated with, you know, by arrogance and all sorts of other worse things than arrogance for, for a very long time, many of them, and, and culturally and socially so. And that defeating the old ruler was probably a very, was a strong motivator. I mean, both for West Indians and Australians. And, and so, and, and there was a sense, but there was also this sense of, the, with the West Indies, it was just the sheer skill of, the skill and performance of the players in that team. See, Tony Gregg was not a, was not a timid man, as you know. I mean, he wasn't, he was also could say a foolish thing or two, but um, as he did indeed at the beginning of that summer, as some of you will know. But um, he was very keen on, and he had a great theory. I mean, the only reason I played was because of his theory, which you, t you touched on. He'd seen some of the series between Australia and West Indies the winter before in Australia, in which, which Australia had won 5-1. But for the first time, the West Indies fast bowling had, had begun to be seen. I mean, I think it was Holdings' first tour, and Roberts was there. And, um, and they had some brilliant batsmen. They had... Uh, uh, who's the opening batsman called? No, but the left-hander. Fredericks. Fredericks and Greenwich and Lloyd and uh, Richardson. Uh, so it was, a, it was the beginnings of a great team. And the Australians had done extremely well, partly by Red Path and Ian Chappell blunting their attack. They'd, they'd accepted being hit. They hadn't gone for glory shots. They hadn't hooked them much. They got out the way, they ducked, they dived, they battled it out. And he thought, 
What he needed was people who would bat like that against the West Indies, and people who had proved it you know, over time. They were not not young, flashy players. He wanted old, reliable players. So he picked this team of grey beards. I mean, he picked, as you say, Edrich, who was 40, Close, who was 45, I was 34, Steele was 35, um, Woolmer even was about 32 or 3, I think. So the whole of the batting lineup was full of aged cricketers. Most people would be retiring by those ages or would have retired long since. And even Close had not put that date in his diary, those dates in his diary for that series of test matches. So it was a, a, a strange idea, but it was an idea, it was a policy, and that's, how, that's why I played for England, really. And, and um, so we thought we were trying pretty hard. Um, uh, but probably there was something that motivated that had a sort of greater devil in it. You've spoken about um, critical knowledge, experts' knowledge, and specifically about leadership, but I, I guess I want to put you on the spot about one type of such knowledge, which is, which you've touched on slightly, the, of what we might call the administration. And if we look at West Indian cricket, uh, it was incredibly ac anachronistic until Worrell. And uh, then there was a period uh, where things seemed to be going right, but at the level of leadership in the administration, it's been quite appalling the last 20 years. I've been working on Yorkshire, celebrating 150 years this year. And of a hundred... Of those 150, I would say 140 years, <laughs> the administration management has been both often anachronistic, often ineffective and inefficient, mm -hmm. and quite appalling for perhaps all but the last 10. Uh, <laughs> and even then, and now I don't want to generalize across all countries, but I mean, <laughs> mm. you know, how can leadership at that level get it wrong so often, I wonder. I wonder whether you agree and whether you've got any insights to the extent that you do share any part of what I'm saying. I'm now I'm a bit suspicious of your general theory, that 140 years of rubbish and 10 years of excellence. I find that a bit <laughs> difficult to believe. But in one sentence, yes, fair enough. I suppose one of the things is to do, which, which I did touch on, is to do with degrees of democracy or, or opinions. You know, I, I mean, even when I started to play cricket for Middlesex, one, once or twice the members of the committee would come into the dressing room and you would have a feeling it was like a visitation to a mill of a Yorkshire mill owner in the 1900s, or early 1900s or 1890s. You know, they'd come with and there was nothing wrong with this, but with their waistcoats and their watch chains dangling. And uh, you'd feel there was a sort of, from, I, mean, I think it was also anxiety. People didn't know how to talk to us or be with us. And it is, it's, it is intimidating to go into a dressing room. It's a private space, you know. It's a, it's a space where people have their own ways of being. And they're antagonistic to outsiders. And they need to be to some extent. You know, you have to keep your privacy and you have to hold on to it as a space that's not the front stage on which you're performing. You know, you can be yourselves in a different way. But anyway, the, so the, the old Yorkshire committees in particular were extremely autocratic. And, you know, a player got sacked for, being, for turning up drunk. Now, maybe sometimes they deserved it, maybe. But you'd think sacked from his career for the rest of his life for being drunk. Now, you'd think that something better could be dealt. You know, that antagonism would then be created between the players and the administrators. There's always going to be tension, by the way. You know, administrators and selectors have different agendas than players do, just as critics have different agendas than performers do. So there's always going to be tension. And there's got to be some hierarchy. I mean, somebody has to take responsibility for decisions within teams and beyond it. But if you can... If you can communicate with different, as we're now called, stakeholders in an organisation, whether they're players or fans or members or committee members or, you know, uh, or, or lead, leaders, coaches, captains, um, 
counselor. Anyway, what, you need to be able to do that. And good leadership and good democracy go hand in hand, and ideas have to be able to come from all over the place. So that's really... Uh, I, I agree with you. that. And the other thing I'd say is it's very hard to do things right and to get things right. It's always easier if you're shooting from the sidelines. Your, the thoughts about the increased commercialism of sport, which is affects, obviously, um, football much more than cricket, but cricket um, uh, also, and the degree to which that has affected loyalty and perhaps the position of West Indian cricket, where, of course, if you once become a hired gun, the, sun, the, sen, the self and the representation of the self mm. and the significance of the self mm. becomes more important than the mm. representative mm. of the mm. larger community mm. you represent, mm. and how much you feel commercialism mm. has disfigured, as it were, mm. a kind of innocence within mm. which the mm. world of Beyond a Boundary was written, mm. and in the world in which you played cricket mm. yourself. Well, it, it's threatened it. I don't know if it's disfigured it. I mean, the, the effort is to try to prevent it disfiguring it. In other words, destroying the whole face or character of it. I mean, one of the ways in which it hasn't disfigured, of course, it has created out of batting strokes which we didn't have before. Well, and it didn't, the, the one-day cricket, in fact, has suddenly developed yeah, a new sort of expressive that's not, space. That's not commercialism. That's a different form of cricket. But it has it's been t stimulated by commercialism, maybe. Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, yes. But not by... It's nothing to do with making money. It's to do with playing cricket in a different way and being open to different forms of innovation. Um, I mean, one-day cricket came in the 1960s, and that transformed cricket too. Um, so I, th I, I don't want to put it... And, and, of course, that was related to adv advertising and, and making money and so on, the fact that cricket was in a pile of state. But as for the money side of it, and, th and the fact that people can be bought by owners of cricket teams in India, let's say, uh, to play for six weeks in the year and make a million and a half dollars, and, and they'd rather do that than play for New Zealand against England or for the West Indies against England in a test match, um, that's a serious problem and not an easy one to deal with. And, you know, uh, when I played cricket, not only did you not get paid for winning the Book of the Year prize, but you didn't get, <laughs> you didn't get paid much for playing for England. And, uh, you know, it was, took Packer and Tony Gregg to rebel against that situation and the West Indies team and the Australian team, most of them, and to provide a situation where the people playing in the centenary test would not be amongst the worst pe paid people in the ground, which was shocking. All this money was coming into cricket, and more could have come into cricket, and nothing was going to the players. So I approved of that, and I approved of the fact that people can make money out of cricket, but it is a difficult tension, and uh, I find it a particularly difficult tension, uh, and the way you put it is very good. It is a difficult tension between loyalty both to a form of cricket... Uh, the, fu the best form of cricket, I think, test two innings test match cricket, uh, towards one's country as opposed to a club, towards one's club as opposed to being a member of any club as a mercenary who goes around as a hired gun, you know, as you, as you say. And I think it's a very difficult thing to combat. We're trying to combat it. Hard. What the outcome will be, I don't know. I, I wonder whether, just, just to add as a, a closing thought on this and to pull us back to James, two of the cricketers that, that, he, uh, that, that have been named time and time again in terms of James's writing about them o over the past couple of days have been W.G. Grace and S.F. Barnes. If we're going to think about golden ages, then these would seem to be two classic examples of very different cricketers, very different class backgrounds and so forth, who followed the money. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, Barnes, who, who played yeah. relatively little first-class cricket simply because there was money uh, uh, in, in club cricket, uh, who, who refused to play for England on occasions because he wasn't being paid enough. And, and, the, ro and the role of gambling in early cricket. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, could we thank Mike again? Yeah. <laughs>